For one year, I worked for a funeral home. One day, I arrived at a rundown old building to remove the remains of a man who had died alone. The police were there to inventory the deceased man's possessions. They reached into several holes in the bedroom walls and pulled out jewels, rubies, sapphires, emeralds, diamonds by the handful, and wads of cash. This man had astonishing wealth, but he lived in terrible poverty. In his message today, Pastor Charlie warns all of us about living our Christian lives like that. Having become heirs of God, we live in spiritual poverty. Please don't miss Charlie's excellent message today. I'm so glad that you're with us today. It's always a joy for us to come together, even if it's like this. I'm going to be brief with the announcements today because nothing much has changed. 
But I do want to say as we start, Happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there. I trust you're celebrating today with your family and that's the way it should be. The Bible says direct your children onto the right paths and when they are older they will not leave it. May God bless all the dads who endeavor to lead their children on a godly path. Now in the matter of opening churches, I'm sure that you received a mailing this week from uh, Jenny and Donna. Be sure to look that mailing over because this week one of the pastors will be calling you to get your input regarding whether to reopen the church at this time and if so, in what form. Now, as I've been reminding you, this Wednesday is Pastor's Moving Day, 24th. Many pastors will be saying goodbye to the congregations they have served for several years and then beginning new periods of ministry with new congregations. I'm sure it will be an emotional time for many of them. And then finally, this coming Saturday is our annual conference. It begins at 1 in the afternoon. If there are any significant developments from this conference, we will let you know next week. All right. Our first hymn this morning is a song written by a great hymn writer, Isaac Watts, in 1707. It's called Marching to Zion. Now this is an interesting version of it because the choir that sings it sings a cappella. That means no instruments. Which is pretty tricky because you have to get the harmony perfect and the timing perfect. Listen if you want, but sing together with them if you can. We're marching to Zion. from the Gospel of Matthew. One verse, Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! 
For you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now with today's message, Life's Uncut Pages, here's Pastor Charlie. Let us pray. Almighty Father, giver of all gifts, give to me now your message, the voice to deliver it to all your people, and the wisdom and understanding to apply it to our lives through the infilling power of the Holy Spirit and to the praise and the glory of our Savior and Lord, Christ Jesus. Amen. Dr. Lewis Banks, an old Methodist preacher, has told the best story I know of in interpreting this sentence. These you ought to have done and not to leave the others undone. He said, one day a boy came to his father and said, Dad, it's six weeks before I go away to college. And I was wondering if you were going to give me a going away present. If you are, I have a suggestion to make. The father, smiling indulgently, answered, What is your suggestion, son? And his eyes sparkled as he replied, Dad, could you find me an old second-hand Ford, one that I could take with me and paint the sides all crazy like the father still smiling asked would you not like to have a new one a car no one else has ever run the young man's eyes opened wide in astonishment could i have a new one could you afford it father replied thoughtfully, maybe you can, but I will not promise today. The next night, when the father got home from the office, he brought a book to his son and asked him as a personal favor to read every page of it. The leaves of the book had not been cut apart. It was brand new. The father called his son's attention to that and said, cut them apart as you read it. A week went by before the boy hesitantly asked about the car. Immediately, the father asked how far he had read in the book. Only about half of it was the reply. And again the father said, please read it all just as soon as you can. The boy went up to his room and started to read for a while. As the days went by, he asked again and again about the car. And every time his father said, I haven't quite decided. How about the book? And every time the son would say, I will finish it right away. Then came the last evening before college. And the boy said, seriously, Dad, I do not understand you. 
this time. You and I have always been such pals, and we've always been so frank with each other. Tell me why I did not get the car. And the father said, Son, go get me the book I ask you to read. The boy stammered as he said, I've read it all but the last few pages. His dad took out his pocket knife and cut the uncut pages. And from between two of them slithered a check made out to an automobile dealer. It was payment in full for a brand new car. The boy took it in great joy and then stopped short, very still. For it dawned on him that the check had been there all along and because he had failed to do what his father asked of him, he had missed the joy of owning the car for a month. He turned to his father with tears rolling down his cheeks and he tore up the check. He said, Dad, I do not deserve it. Well, the father said to him, Son, we miss a lot of things in life when we leave uncut the pages that we ought to cut. You have learned a valuable lesson. So, we will go get the car. It has been waiting for you for a month. All gassed up, full of oil, and ready to run. How true this story is. When we leave undone the things we ought to do, we miss receiving some of the grandest blessings that our Heavenly Father ever offered. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus is entirely in character. He was trying to widen the horizons of the people who were the religious leaders of his day, but who were leaving uncut many of the pages of religious life. Jesus might have spoken the same words to Christian leaders today. The fact is, Jesus did speak them, and it is certain he meant them for us. There are many pages we need to cut. The first page so many of us leave uncut is the page of unreserved commitment. There are people in the community who must wonder just how seriously our church and each of us takes Jesus Christ. Both we and our church get into trouble when Christ is not taken seriously. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, the cost of discipleship may have been right when he said, and I quote, this generation knows little of the consecration that costs anything. We have admired the beauty of Jesus' life. We acknowledge the wisdom of his teachings. We've used the cross as a symbol in art and worship, but it has not cost us anything in blood or sweat or pain." End of quote. 
Could it be possible that we have lifted Jesus up and set him on a pedestal in our churches, worshiped him, and left him hanging on the cross? It is a most dangerous thing to think that we will treat him as heathens treat his idols, bring him an offering and not necessarily a tithe offering, kneel for a little while before him, spend one or two hours on an occasional Sunday, and then go away and live our lives as if he had never lived or died. This is probably most exactly what Jesus saw when he looked at the crowd and was prompted to say, these things you should have done, but not in order to leave other things undone. True Christian commitment will mean that we will do our best to walk as Jesus walked and to live as Jesus lived. When we bring this down to everyday living, it means that we will accept whatever task, small or great, the church gives us in his name to help build the kingdom of God. Indeed, it will mean that we are taking our vows of church membership and our profession of faith seriously enough so that we will go looking for things we can do to help build the kingdom of God. Dr. Roy Smith, a Methodist minister, has a good illustration in one of his sermons about two people who were sitting on the porch of the local country store. One of them is a big man towering over the other with a huge frame covered by bulging muscles. The other is a small man, very evidently awed by his companion's size. He exclaims, what a man you are. You're about the most man I have ever seen. Do you know what I would do if I was as much of a man as you are? And the friend replied, what would you do, little man? Why, I would go over into those woods and find me the biggest, blackest, meanest bear in the woods, and I would tackle him barehanded and alone and tear him jaw from jaw and limb from limb just to show what a man I was. That is what I would do. Slowly, the big fellow turns his head toward the little man and jerks his thumb towards the woods. He says, listen to me, little man. There are plenty of little bears over in those woods. Why do you not go wrestle one of them? We leave undone things that we ought to do. The second uncut page that deserves our attention is the building up of spiritual reserves. Christianity and God are, for too many people, like a rescue squad to be used in case of emergencies. Some of you may have read a little book by the well-known Hollywood star of years past, Mary Pickford. Why not try God? Well, this is exactly what multitudes do. 
they try everything else first and then turn to God as a last resort. God offers to us a continual fellowship. In the warmth of that fellowship, strong spiritual reserves are stored away and a healthy character and spiritual life is grown. Jesus was talking about reserves when he told the parable of the ten virgins. Note that he did not call the second five wicked, nor refer to them as sinners. Rather, he called them foolish. They did not plan ahead and bring extra oil for their lamps. You know, sometimes I get really tired of hearing people say, Preacher, I am trying my best to get right with God. Or, Preacher, I will leave my, uh, give my life to Christ and turn to the church when I have changed my life. Let me tell you, people just do not have that kind of reserve power within themselves. The willpower is just not there. Also, we should not have to weigh every appeal that comes to us to do the wrong thing. We should all, once and for all, let Jesus Christ into the program of our hearts and lives. And when a temptation comes, the decision will be automatic. Temptation should not be allowed a foot in the door of our heart. This was Balaam's mistake. Remember the story? When King Balak offered him beautiful gifts to come and curse the Israelites, he entertained the messengers overnight. And when he sent back his answer, it was neither dogmatic nor definite enough to suit the king. The prophet uh, Jeremiah asks, can a leopard change his spots? Surely the opposite is true. A person who lets Jesus Christ into his life carries a surplus of spiritual strength because he lives for Christ, and it will not be easily, easy to do the wrong thing. We should stop using God only in time of emergency and as a filling station and make him part of our everyday lives. The story is told of a Miami minister who had, had a visitor whom he had never seen. There had been a very damaging hurricane, and she wanted the answer to a question. She said, I prayed as hard as anybody in this town that God would protect my home and family, but the hurricane completely destroyed my house. Tell me why. Not knowing anything about her, the pastor asked, are you a Christian and are you committed to be a builder of the kingdom? And she replied, no, I am not. But God ought to hear the prayer of everyone. The minister's answer is classic. Lady, I know God 
heard your prayer. But I do not know why God seems not to have heard your prayer unless it was that he was busy taking care of regular customers. We need to build spiritual reserves. The third uncut page comes from Paul. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Or all things are possible, only believe. When I was a child, I learned a little chorus that went like this. Only believe, only believe. All things are possible, only believe. Only believe, only believe. All things are possible, only believe. Do you be really believe this is true? Is it true that our church can be the greatest today it has ever been? Do we really believe that there is nothing we cannot accomplish in the name of Jesus Christ? John records Jesus as telling his followers, because I go to the Father, greater works shall you do than I have done. Do we really believe all things to be possible through Christ? What follows these words in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9 are the words of an anguished father. I believe, Lord. I believe. Please help my unbelief. I have a feeling for that man. For though I believe the words of my Savior, am I able to do things greater even than his? You know, good speed gives us an answer. He translates the word unbelief as faith. Good speech translation of this scripture says, I believe, Lord, I believe. Help my lack of faith. Now the difference is not as great as at once it might appear for. Increasing faith does increase an individual's belief. But either way, it is a prayer that should rise daily from our hearts. No one ever passes beyond the need of it. In some areas of life, we believe with an undivided heart. In others, our highest point is reached in the words, help my lack of faith. On days that are sunny, our heart is fixed and we have no need to think consciously about God. But under overcast skies, our hearts are clouded with doubt. The poet Sidney Lanier writes, O oh, age that believes your own half believe, half doubts the substance of your own doubt, and half perceiving you half perceive. Stand at the temple door, heart in but head out. Lo, while your heart is inside, helping out the choir, Without, your eyes range up and down the street. Heart in, head out. That describes many Christians. The split personality of Christianity. The kingdom 
comes. It is here, and we only have to believe it. Christ is the answer. His words are all true. All things are possible for you, for your family, and for your church. Grab hold of Jesus Christ. He is yours. He died for you. Make him your own. Open up the pages of Scripture that reveal the consecrated cross and its completion in the resurrection, and you will go forward in glorious, victorious living. Give yourself today, right now, to Jesus Christ in unreserved commitment, in the building up of spiritual reserves, and believe that all things are possible. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm sure our closing hymn is familiar to you. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Let's sing it together. And now may you experience the love, grace, mercy, joy, power, and life of God in ways you never thought possible, not only throughout this week, but forever. Never settle for anything less than God's best for you.